Okay, welcome everybody. I'll add to Tom's uh, welcome. And uh, I, I just need to say that uh, this actual, this program is made possible with funds from the decentralization program, a regrant program of the New York State Council on the Arts with the support of Governor Andrew Cuomo and the New York State Legislature and administered by the Genesee Valley Council on the Arts. And I'm very pleased to welcome our uh, presenter uh, this evening, uh, Cynthia Houck. Uh, she's a native of Rochester, New York. Uh, she has worked for over 30 years in the field of preservation uh, planning as a member of the Landmark Society of Western New York, one of America's oldest historic preservation organizations. Her projects with both local residents, neighborhood associations, and area governments uh, in a nine county area have included historic resources surveys, nominations to the National Register of Historic Places, and advocacy for the reuse and rehabilitation of historic buildings. A graduate of Mary Washington College of the University of Virginia, she has lectured widely on regional architecture, local history, and the benefits of historic preservation planning. Before I let her start, I want to remind everyone that our bandwidth here is not as, as uh, good as we would like, and so please uh, leave your mics mute, muted and turn off your video so that uh, uh, that saves us uh, our bandwidth. So once you do that, we'll be in good shape and we'll get started and uh, hopefully we'll have some other people joining us. But meanwhile, uh, here's Cynthia. All right, Cynthia. Thank you, Joan. How is my audio? Can you hear, is my audio coming through all right? Audio is fine. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that nice introduction. I'm delighted to be in Nunday on an absolutely glorious spring day that we could get all of you trapped in your homes is a real achievement because it makes means that you're interested in and want to learn more about the two centuries of historic architecture in your village and town. This historic, the Discover None Day talk is something Joan and I have talked about for a long time because we have certainly been, <clears throat> excuse me, talking about historic preservation opportunities in Nunday, Day, which is a real hotbed of preservation innovation over the last several, several decades. And so it's really a lovely opportunity to, during National Historic Preservation Month, which we celebrate every May as a national holiday, to talk about some of the great architecture in your community, which defines what Nunday Day is all about. We sometimes get used to driving past building structures and properties and we don't think about them that often. Sometimes we don't think about them at all until maybe they're lost or torn down. And we don't we realize that these were something that was of real importance to their community. It not only identifies why Nunday Day is Nunday Day and not Mount Morris, Dansville, or Ocean, but it also tells the story of all of the people who have lived in Nunday Day over the last 200 years. Now, of course, one of the challenges of being a Nunday resident is explaining nonstop that you are not a resident of Nunda, New York. You are a resident of Nunday, New York, an absolutely glorious location in the foothills of the Allegheny Mountains. And the name Nunday comes from the Seneca peoples who were the original settlers here. And it refers to where the valley meets the hills. And anyone that's had the opportunity to come from Mount Morris heading south as you gain elevation on a beautiful sunny spring day as you come near, come into Nunday is one of the most beautiful vistas anywhere in the Finger Lakes. Fortunately, it's a state road, so thousands of people do travel, but I often wonder how many people are really aware of the incredible view that you get as you come into Nunday, New York. Now, Nunday, like many, many communities in Western New York, started with a different name. You were actually called Nunday Valley. You, were the, you had some of the local features that made for an opportunity for settlement. You had several Native American footpaths that came together. Eventually they became roads. 
You also had water power, which was an absolutely key element of any community developing during the 19th century. When you think of Nunday today, one of the things you always think about when you have guests in your home, you like to make a good impression when they're coming to visit you at your personal house. We also like to make an impression, a good impression, certainly a memorable impression when somebody comes to visit your own community. I really enjoy seeing the welcome to Nunday sign that you have at the different gateways into your, into your community. Now you may take these for granted, but this is a really important part of your creating an identity for yourself. So having that kind of a unique looking entry welcome sign is important. Another key factor for any community is to not look like somebody else. There is a book called The Geography of Nowhere, and actually there's two of them with a similar title, written by a historic preservationist who says, with so many communities today having a McDonald's hamburger franchise on every corner or another Home Depot or another Walmart, everybody is starting to look like everybody else. So you really don't, after a while, don't know where you are. It's the geography of nowhere. I'm delighted to see that that is not the problem in Nunday, New York. You have very specific items that welcome members to your community, not only the more traditional welcome sign, but the very handsome cow at a place that I have patronized many times without thinking about my waistline. And that is the delicious and delectable ice cream parlor as you're coming into Nunday from Mount Morris. I was so happy to come this two Sundays ago to take a, another drive around the community and remind myself about your architecture and parlor with its Michigan, New York, and Giffords of Maine ice cream. So while this is wonderful to see this building repurposed for an ice cream parlor, it's also nice that the local owner who has the ice cream parlor has not only a sense of humor, but a sense of original decor. And she has not only this handsome cow, but one of my favorite things, she has interpretive signs. While you're sitting in the parking lot, or visiting for ice cream, you can learn always all about the dairy industry and ice cream. So she has put together a very interesting commercial destination that's not duplicated anywhere else in your community. And when you lost your historic ice cream parlor about 10 years ago, I was really excited to see that you now have a new ice cream parlor as you enter Nunday, New York. One of the benefits of coming to Nunday is that you're on a state road and anybody visiting Nunday, even if they're just driving through, are getting to see some of your most wonderful, not only wonderful architecture, but buildings that you have been very creative in finding adaptive uses for them. Here on North State Street, residence of a successful business person, later on becoming, I believe, a skilled nursing home, but most recently, a very practical adaptive reuse in that you have combined both the town offices and the village offices together in this historic building, which also has one of the most spectacular carriage houses in Livingston County. So you as a community and a municipality are really at the cutting edge of a setting example for your community in that your town and village government came together and decided that they would repurpose this very important Queen Anne style mansion as the government center. Downtown Nunday is one of the few communities that still has a remnant of its original village square. While many of our first settlers in Western New York came from New England, there are not many villages that were established with village squares, much less have a surviving village square. You do, as does Leicester, as does the village of Geneseo when you're in Livingston County. Here on your village square, you have some of the oldest architecture in the village, particularly Merchant's Row, that built that row of two-story buildings that you see to the left, 
which has been in place since well before the Civil War. Fortunately, it continues to have commercial establishments in the first story, which is the way it was designed, as well as apartments in the second story. When people hear about living above the store, this is exactly what they were talking about for so many decades in any commercial downtown. The other positive factor of having Merchants Row survive is like other villages, Nunday had, its, had serious fires that often, in the case of when I did a study in Caledonia, it wiped out the majority of historic commercial buildings in their village core. You are so lucky to have these early pre-Civil War, an entire row of the buildings that have survived. Now, one of the most interesting things you have on your village green is the structure with the bell. And that bell came from your village hall. Here is a wonderful color postcard from the turn of the last century that shows your community building, the village hall, which is still used today by the police department and the original bell tower that sat at the northwest corner. 1880s, 1890s, and the turn of the century, many municipal governments, be they village or city, were looking to establish buildings of great elegance, particularly if you had a village hall, a city hall, or a library. So here in Nunday, New York, the village fathers were part of that progressive movement and they have this lovely architect design building that is still survives today. In the photograph, you can see that there was a drinking fountain out in front, most likely for the horses, because this is horse and carriage era. But the other item I wanted to mention about these color postcards, most of these were published in Germany, which is rather unusual. Why were there postcards of thousands of villages and towns throughout America being published in Germany? Well, there was a robust lithograph industry in Germany, but also too, this was the internet of the turn of the last century. You would have a postcard like this. And if you had come to visit from Geneseo and to visit a family member in Nunday, you would take one of these local postcards and scribble a little message on it and drop it in the, in the local post box. And it would get back to Geneseo or Caledonia, not as fast as an internet email, but it was somewhat like that. So when you see these, this, for every community, there are so many of these postcards produced at the turn of the 19th and 20th century. That's part of the reason that they were so popular is they were a way of sending a quick message in the mail without having to bother with a letter. And it also promoted a local community. It would have a picture of a village hall, one of the local churches, or in many cases, a picture of a person's house would be on the front of these postcards. Whenever a new community is formed, and this is no different from Geneseo, Caledonia, Nunday, Dansville, certainly one of the first public buildings to be erected is a house of worship. We have a tremendous legacy of historic houses of worship in the Genesee Valley dating back to the early 19th century. Certainly this beautiful church in this village of Nunday is designed in the robust Greek revival style, which was popular between the 1830s and 60s, the era in which the Erie Canal opened and New York State became the Empire State. That's when we got our nickname because of the exploding success of transportation and businesses. And most communities to show that they were popular and they were successful and they knew about the latest styles, started constructing their earliest buildings in this classical design. So you will see houses, churches, schools, municipal halls, even barns and farm outbuildings. And I've even seen a Greek revival outhouse built in the Greek revival style that even today in New York state, we have more buildings that survive that are of the Greek revival style than any other era in our state. And that's because it was the era of Erie Canal and for your community, Genesee Valley Canal prosperity. Other churches that have subsequently been built in your community are not just the wood frame church you see on the left, but the handsome later 19th century Gothic revival style church on the right built of local brick and a very handsome design. Your church architecture in Nunday has a very wonderful history. And originally I wanted, there was a third church near here that was 
very much like the Greek Revival Church that you see on the left. And that was the Presbyterian Church that sadly, when their congregation was became much too small, they merged with the brick church that you are seeing on the right. But parts of their building were saved and today can still be enjoyed. I thought you would enjoy seeing a photograph of the sanctuary of the Presbyterian Church. And here it is, it's unfortunately demolished in 1979. Here you can see one of the most impressive examples of Greek revival style religious architecture in the Genesee Valley. Those robust columns, those beautiful anthemian trim in the over, over the columns in the cornice. It had surviving beautiful galleries on either side for additional seating, historic lighting fixtures. And I'm pleased to report one of the largest items in this picture is the historic pipe organ which was carefully taken and moved across the street to the other Greek revival church where it has been restored and can be enjoyed today. So this is an unfortunate loss of an important building, though today you do have a very lovely community park on the site. The downtown areas where we're going to, we're going to take a walk today, even though we would love in this kind of weather, I would love to have you gather and walk as a walking tour like Joan Shoemaker organized about 10 years ago. We're gonna take a walk around downtown and then we're gonna go out and look at the community's residential architecture. Here is part of Merchant's Row, a really excellent example of a pre-Civil War era building that retains its original woodwork, its original design, and even those glorious six over six double hung wood sash. The next time you go to the shop, Please go inside, even though you might not be a quilter, and you will get to see the original interior layout and many, many drawers that were part of the original commercial inside. As you open the front door, be sure to take a very close look at the exquisite East Lake style paneling and woodwork detail on those front doors that are now painted a very robust green and purple. One of the great secrets of downtown Nunday are the upper floor auditoriums, which I've had a chance to visit. You are a remarkable community in that you not have only one or two, but you have three upper floor auditoriums. One of them is a pre-Civil War ballroom that is over the pharmacy on the downtown's Village Square, that incredible ballroom still retains its original early 19th century wallpaper and decorative details. Here at the Livingston House, you have a building that's post-Civil War. And with those tall windows in the upper floor, that is often a clue that there is an auditorium upstairs. Now we call some of these auditoriums opera houses, but believe me, most of the performances there were not professional singers who sang opera. It was just a way to show that you had an elegant theater that was available for touring performing companies. And there was a robust performance circuit. As long as you had canal access or later railroad access, there were performers that traveled all over the United States to these village opera houses that, and performed from the mid 19th into the early 20th century. Now we've been looking at some buildings that have more elaborate design, but I want to always be sure to point out the buildings that are more modest in design, but have incredible connections to the success and history of a community. And that is their industrial architecture. Now on this slide, I have put a saying that is seen in a mosaic in downtown Rochester in the Rochester Savings Bank. Industry and thrift are the foundations of prosperity. And my guess is the very dedicated natives of Nunday, New York with their very interesting history of industry and commercial enterprises use this phrase as the basis for creating their industries. This is a very distinctive building though very plain in appearance on South State Street. It has been somewhat camouflaged by 20th century siding. But if you look at the windows, these are the original 12 panes over 12 pane wood sash windows on the rice repair shop. 
a very important and quite early surviving industrial building located very close to the creek, which is where many industrial buildings were constructed. But I wanted to start our discussion of industrial buildings with this building that thousands of people drive by every week, but I have a feeling probably have never seen your oldest surviving industrial buildings in Monday. The building that most people think of when they think of Monday industry is the Foot Company building on North State Street. This was a nationally known company that had won national, won gold medals at World's Fairs. And for many decades, its mixing equipment that was critical to the construction of roads was marketed not only all over the United States, but beyond. Here's a 1940s photograph of the Foot Company manufacturing campus. Again, a distinctive building from its time period, the surviving part is being used by another enterprise. So the foot company we're going to be talking about a little bit as we go through the slides because they had a lot of effect on the community. Another building I wanted to point out that you all think of today is the nut butter factory is an enterprise most people would be very surprised. What do you mean you're making silk fabric in the, in the Genesee Valley? Well, believe it or not, there were a number of communities that were doing silk manufacturing and this building with its distinctive sawtooth shaped roof, but those were original, originally those had windows that were open for ventilation and light. This is a very interesting and important building, not only for its original use, but for its construction. It is built out of cast concrete block, a very popular building material in the 1890s through 1930s. It was inexpensive. It could be made locally at a local lumber yard or masonry factory, and it was fireproof. And if you read some of the ads, it was also vermin free. So if you had a food processing plant, the, that would be a very important factor. But certainly the fireproof factor made this a popular building material, an affordable building material, and often the building material used for the first garages and auto repair shops that you see in any community because of the use of oil and gasoline being flammable, you would see early garages and repair shops for automobiles made out of this very popular and quite handsome building material. Now, as we went, as Nunday progressed through the 19th century, certainly the final, finally the arrival of the Genesee Valley Canal in 1851, the valley had been clamoring for a canal to come from Rochester and hopefully the canal was going to go all the way to Pennsylvania. It's a long story with a not completely successful ending. But by after the Civil War, the prosperity of Nunday increased and you can see that by some of the interesting architecture that was built on Main Street, particularly the Union Block designed by a Rochester architect in the 1880s who came together and decided they needed to do something elegant for architecture and the downtown area. And this was the resulting building. Next door is the Carter Memorial, which we will talk more about in a little bit. I wanted to show you this historic view of the Union Block because it usually shocks many people when they say, oh my gosh, look, there are turrets, there are dormers. Look at, there's more to that building than we've ever seen in 2021. And you are correct. This is Nunday's most impressive commercial block. And that was the exact purpose of the original five gentlemen who built this, where, and it became known more for its newspaper, the Nunday newspaper's headquarters, but there were four other companies. This building is unique in Western New York. And in recent decades, not only was, were the first five gentlemen who combined to make this a trademark project for the community in the 1880s. But in recent decades, Joan Shoemaker and others combined to purchase this building when it was in need of a rehab. So this has been a, in a, your most impressive building re rehabilitation to date. And hats off to those original 1880s owners who constructed this, as well as the recent visionaries who decided to buy it, rehabilitate it, and get it back functioning as the, the most important commercial building in their community. 
The Carter Memorial Building, anyone who has driven through Nunde has probably been baffled by this incredibly elegant, sophisticated, and one-of-a-kind building. There are certainly no other villages that have an American Legion Hall that looked anything like the Carter Memorial Building, which was built in the early 1900s. It was built by a gentleman who had started his life in Nunde. He went into service in the Civil War. John Carter also was the winner of the Congressional Medal of Honor, but where he became very successful was going just a little over the border into Titusville, Pennsylvania, where he struck oil and became incredibly successful in the petroleum industry. This was his gift to Nunde in honor of the Union Army. Today, it is still the used as a meeting hall for the American Legion. So when people come to Nunde or anyone I've ever touched them cold in their tracks because it is not like anything else in the region. And when they hear the history of the building, they're really impressed in the fact that Nunde has this building is a great asset for your whole community. Now, speaking of philanthropy, Mr. Carter was not the only philanthropist. Libraries that we take for granted today were not in every community. And again, at the turn of the last century, when you were in the progressive era, you start to see public libraries free of charge where you could come and collect and check out books. In a number of communities, those were funded by the Carnegie Foundation. If you go over to Warsaw, New York, there's a Carnegie Library there, as there is in downtown the village of Perry. Here in Nunde, your elegant classical revival, Bell Memorial Library was a gift of the Bell family to the village of Nunde, a really beautiful, exquisitely designed building, and very much in the, the philanthropic history of the turn of the 20th century, when many local families were contributing to construction of libraries. If you go over to Castile, New York, you will see the Cordelia Green Library, named after the first woman physician in that community. Transportation. One of my great treats driving around Nunday day was discovering you have probably the largest collection of stone mounting blocks and cast iron hitching posts of any tent village in Livingston County. This common object in the age of horse transportation is quite uncommon today. In World Wars I and II, many of these cast iron posts were collected for scrap metal drives. And of course, when people were no longer driving horses and buggies, they didn't need a hitching post, much less a limestone mounting block. And I think this is the mounting block in the village that actually has the family's name inscribed on it. So when you drive, particularly on Massachusetts Street, take a look at the varied designs and remarkable number of surviving cast iron hitching posts that you have in Nunday, day because that is a real surprise and a great added feature of your residential neighborhoods. Storybook architecture. Now, I'm not going to read you from Grimm's Fairy Tales. It was one of the great surprises when I first saw this, and I talked to Jim Shoemaker about its evolution. If you take a look at this building, it kind of looks like a Hansel and Gretel cottage. It has that charming round arch door, that swooping gabled roof. It looks like a little cottage you might see in England or somewhere in a German forest. And indeed, in the 1920s and 30s, this type of storybook inspired architecture became very popular for commercial buildings, but mo more for houses. This was built, my understanding is, as a commercial building right there on Route 436, which is a state highway. And when this was constructed in the 1920s and 30s, automobile recreation tra travel, those famous Sunday drives were starting to be promoted to tourists and local residents alike. So often when a new commercial entrepreneur decided to build a small shop, they might decide to use this early 20th century storybook style architecture, like you see in this charming little stucco building on North State Street. 
transportation in the 20th century, obviously, I've just referenced that horses and buggies were retired and the automobile age comes. And in downtown Nunday, you have the long standest that has been in the Joan Shoemaker's family for some time. But one of the items that is most eye catching as you come to the flashing light at the four corners and you turn right to head toward Portage is the thrilling sight of not one but two historic neon signs that are still beautifully in place on this commercial building. I don't know how many of you have even noticed these. You may have driven by them many times, but this is one of the most wonderful commercial advertising artifacts you have in the community. And we are thrilled to see that they continue to stay in place because these are often removed and sold elsewhere. But for automotive transportation history, this is a real feather in your cap that you have two of these on this in the, in the village and they happen to be on the same building. Now, as part of downtown, we do have several residential buildings that are quite remarkable. This is 39 North State Street, a true arts and crafts showcase of architecture in all original condition, beautifully articulated, obviously the work of an architect. It includes a drive-through port cochere on the side of the building so you can get out of your car in the rain and not get wet. And my understanding, this was built by one of the two Foot brothers who started the Foot Manufacturing Company. This house does not look like any other house our staff has seen in the region. And it's a real thrill to see that this is right on Main Street and, in, and that the owners have been great stewards of the building. Now, next door to this house is a gambro Roof Dutch Colonial Revival house that I was told was built by Mr. Foot next door for one of his children. And this often happens in families of prosperous businessmen, you often hear about a father building a house as a wedding for present for one of his daughters that's getting married. The intriguing house that needs a little more research, is, which means you could order this from a catalog. All of the parts, the windows, the doors, the hardware, the roof, the stone would come in a number of railroad box cars. They would be delivered from most likely the company was in Michigan. And they would come to Nunday, and then you would have a local craftsman put the entire house together from all of the parts that arrived on the railroad. We know that thousands of kit buildings, houses, commercial buildings, garages were manufactured, but we rarely know where they are. So if we can find out that this is indeed a kit, kit originated building, that would be very exciting. Let's go down Massachusetts Street. We're leaving the downtown area. We're now going down one of your most distinctive streets for architecture. In the foreground, you can see a pair of surviving cast iron fishing posts with another one of the limestone mounting blocks. And in the background, one of the handsomest Greek revival buildings in Livingston County. A walk down Massachusetts Street brings all kinds of architecture to the fore that was popular from about the Civil War to the turn of the century. I thought you'd enjoy seeing yet another postcard view showing Massachusetts Street at the turn of the century before it was paved, but yet you, you can still see there are hitching posts and mounting blocks in front of what is a very interesting row of Queen Anne style residences. The Queen Anne style is epitomized by this house on Massachusetts Street. Porches, porches, porches. You did not have air conditioning, you didn't have electricity, and you wanted fresh air, particularly in the summertime. So a one-story, or in this case, a remarkable two-story porch on this house is an excellent example of that Queen Anne era of architecture. And in this case, it retains all its original porch posts and decorative woodwork. Slightly farther down Massachusetts Avenue, we have this almost shingle style with the swooping roof. It's got a combination of arts and crafts bungalow as well as shingle style design. What is so distinctive about this is very early in its history, it appears that the porch became enclosed with those beautifully detailed decorative windows that mimic the same windows that you see upstairs in the upper enclosed porch. 
other houses on Massachusetts Avenue that showed distinct changes over time, but that does not mean that that's a negative to the architecture, is a house that we have here. And I wanted to talk about that picture window that you see on the first story. Not original probably to the 1900 um, era of when this was built, but this is called a Chicago style window that becomes very popular in the 1920s. It has a large central window flanked by two smaller windows. And this is, becomes very popular. And in many houses where you had two smaller windows, it may have been in the 1920s that an, an owner decided that this was a much more preferred window. And today, because this is now a window that was added more than 50 years ago, this is now a historic part of the building. I haven't mentioned too much about the term historic architecture, but we in the historic preservation field say that any building or structure that is 50 or more years old is potentially considered historic architecture. This building on Massachusetts Street with its elaborate front porch and decorative brackets is more likely to what people considered historic when they're thinking of architecture, usually buildings that were constructed before 1900. However, historic architecture comes in many shapes, sizes, and flavors, and rehabilitation in the school of Martha Stewart is not something we invented in the last 40 years. Renovation, rehabilitation, and additions to buildings happen over time. You can see on this house on Massachusetts Street, this is one of the rare houses that is, was built with a French style second empire roof. That's that angled roof that you see above the first story that became very popular in the 1870s and 80s, but is really not seen very often in rural villages. I would like this house as a present from my father. And that is exactly what Miss Foote achieved. This remarkable architect designed Tudor, spelled T-U-D-O-R, revival style house on Massachusetts Street was the result of a gift by one of the two Foote brothers who started foot manufacturing. In this case, Mr. Foote, who lived on Massachusetts Street. This remarkable one-of-a-kind Tudor Revival house is definitely one of the most unusual homes in all of Livingston County, but it is a really spectacular example of that design that while it harkens to medieval English architecture, it's very much of the 20th century. And if you take a look really closely, you can see the beautiful diamond paned windows on the first story and on the side where you see the plaster and dark brown wood trim, we call that half timbering. This is where her father lived across the street, 25 Massachusetts Avenue. It actually started as a quite different house, but as Mr. Foote, like many other businessmen, became successful, he decided, he decided to expand and improve his house and the result is this robust example of Queen Anne style architecture with that trademark Queen Anne style tower at the corner. Of course, it has one of the large Queen Anne style porches that really were meant to be your summer living room. You actually brought your living room furniture out onto the porch in the 1880s and 90s and 1910s because that is where there would be a breeze and you could, if you were wearing a corset or gentlemen, you were in high collared shirts and wool trousers, you wanted to catch any breeze possible because electric fans and our air conditioning were in the, in the future. This is a very interesting pr property because not only do you have this extremely elegant design Queen Anne residence, you have a port coat chair on the right. And the next time you walk down Massachusetts, be sure to look at the fabulous grape arbor that is in the backyard. Other houses on Massachusetts Street may not be as robust and large, but when we look at historic architecture, we are not just looking at how big is the building and it was it designed by somebody prominent. Most buildings in a community are represented by those who are of more modest means, but still were interested in constructing a house with details, such as you see here on this Italianate style home with the decorative brackets underneath the roof. When we drive around one day, it is obvious your most successful era of economic business enterprises were during the Italianate period of the 1880s to about 1890s, because you have more examples of Italianate style houses than any other style 
in the community. And this is one of those Italianate style houses. Another Massachusetts street example of an Italianate style house. Again, you can see another variation with the decorative brackets underneath of the porch and the main roof of the house. And that isn't a flat roof, that's called a hipped roof. It has four different slopes at a very um, shallow pitch. And that is another trademark of this style. One of the most spectacular houses in Nunday is this Greek Revival style house on the north side of Massachusetts Street. Those robust Corinthian columns, the flat, not even, not clapboard, but if you look at the siding very carefully, that is flush siding, which is very distinctive of the Greek Revival style. You have symmetry, having a center entrance doorway, and then you have the windows. On, it flares out at the top, we call that shouldered molding. This again is the Greek Revival style I prefaced earlier that you have more examples in Western New York of Greek Revival style architecture, but this is certainly one of the most important in Nunday. We're gonna continue down Massachusetts Street and see more of the Italianate style architecture. And you might kind of wonder, why are we talking about Italian architecture in the Genesee Valley? Isn't that a little unusual? Not really. Most of the 19th century Americans were still thinking of themselves as a very young country. And many of the ideas for our local architecture came to us from Europe. We got ideas from English architecture, French architecture, and Italian architecture. Now we did, we put our own, but that is the reason when I'm talking about Gothic revival or Tudor revival, or in this case, Italianate, we are taking our cues, at least in the 19th century, much of the design that's coming to the United States from Europe. More Italianate style design on Massachusetts Avenue, this another porch. You could have a lovely poster called Porches of Nunday, and many of them on Massachusetts Street would be included. Now a more modest house on Massachusetts Street is this Greek Revival house, and I this because it is stuccoed over. And in the 1920s, many modern Better Homes and Gardens magazines, unlike today when we hear use vinyl, it's, it will give you a maintenance free house. In the 1920s, they were advertising stucco that if you put stucco over your wood clapboard, it would give you a maintenance free house. And we have two interesting examples of that stucco era in Nunday. This is one of them, and you'll see the other later and decorative trim become the trademark of the Queen Anne style, as you can see here on, in the front gables of this house. We also want to make sure to note that in Nunday Village, we are thrilled always to see that there are surviving barns that have, though the horse and buggy era is long gone, outbuildings are an important component of any site. So when we're looking at a residential neighborhood or any neighborhood, it isn't just the main building on the site. We, we are always excited to see any support buildings like a shed, a corn crib, a carriage house, or in this case, a small gable roofed barn. And barns are our most endangered agricultural building. In fact, the Landmark Society will be doing a study of historic barns in the Genesee Valley, hopefully in the upcoming year. Renovation, remodeling, and a house on Vermont Street that started as an 1840s residence, but was later added with a porch and other additions. We wanna make sure that when we look at a building and we talk about its history, that we talk about all phases of its history, not just the original, in this case, 1850s house, but most likely the 1880s porch that was added and has its own history 130 years later. Another Italian aid house wraparound window that you'll see on the, the left side. I haven't seen this on any other house. It was most likely added later. It's a very distinctive and at this point a historic design detail that was added to an older house. Tucked at the southeast corner of Nunday is a very important property that I'm guessing many people have never seen, much less know of. This is Elmwood Estate. It was built by a man who has a lot of success 
in the railroad industry. It consists of an exquisitely designed Italianate style house complete with cupola, original decorative hood over the front door, original lintels over the windows, and a beautiful and impressive collection of barns. Elmwood was designed by Andrew Jackson Warner, Rochester, New York's foremost 19th century architect. Now, that may seem a little unusual. You mean an architect from Rochester came all the way to Nunday? You bet they did. Because of the railroad, architects that practiced in cities could go anywhere and design buildings for any client in just about any community. Over in South Lima, New York, which some of you may know, is a tiny hamlet. It has six architect design buildings by a Rochester architectural firm. Why? Well, there were clients that could hire an architect from Rochester to come to South Lima, or in your case, a client in the village of Nunday who hired the region's foremost architect, Andrew Jackson Warner, to design this magnificent home that has been beautifully cared for for the last 130 plus years. And this property is one of two properties in the community that is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Originally a farming operation, and today the Elmwood Estate still retains its large gambrel, suite of gambrel roof barns, as well as the silo, a very important complex in the village and probably a complex many of the residents don't know about because Elmwood is very much tucked away on Creek Street at the side at the southeast corner of the, the village. Now I've been showing you both, both basically mostly buildings from the 19th century, but time does not stop at 1900. If we're looking at buildings and asking the question, so what's a historic house in Nunday, New York? We could be looking at a house from the 1950s or even 1960s because this is the era of post-World War II development. And this is the type of post-World War II suburban residential architecture you start to see now villages and hamlets in the Genesee Valley. And here is an example on Creek Street of one of your post-World War II suburban development. Likewise, this very dramatic mid-century modern house on Creek Street, possibly the work of an architect with that dramatic swooping roof. And obviously this does not look anything like Elmwood down the street, but this house tells its own story that when, as, when any of us in the Landmark Society survey team visit a building. We never use the description, we think this is a pretty building or a not so pretty building. The most important question we ask when we look at any building such as this, what does this building tell us about the era in which it was built and designed? And this building has as compelling a history as when standing in front of Elmwood and talking. And style houses with towers are not terribly prevalent in the village of Nunday, and this is an excellent example over on Church Street, a very handsome example, probably built somewhere between the 1890s and 1910s. And one thing to keep in mind when you're driving around Nunday, many of the styles that were popular in big cities often came later to rural communities. So you might see, for example, in the village of Webster, New York, I saw a Queen Anne style house with a tower that was built in 1910, clearly almost 20 years beyond when the style was popular. But when you go to a rural area, it's often that these popular styles that you've seen in a city linger and are built at a later date than you might have seen if it was in an urban area. Remodeling is part of our everyday life, no matter if it's a residential building or a commercial building. And sometimes when we look at buildings, we have to take a very, close look that with modern vinyl siding and modern windows, if you look very carefully at the roof line of this building, you actually discover that it was originally a Greek revival building that dates from before the Civil War, though today it has very modern exterior cladding and windows. 
when we look at buildings, they don't always easily fit into one category. And that's fine, it makes them even more interesting. Here's an example at 21 Church Street that has a combination of Greek Revival design. You have a wide cornice, that wide column laster has a very handsome Greek Revival hood. And that railing at the top is called a Belvedere. Instead of having a full cupola, once in a while you would have a building that in the case of this house, there is a full attic in this house. And it's likely they have a ladder or staircase up to a roof hatch that the original owners would have access to the roof. And again, not only a design feature, but something that was fun. And instead of having a front porch, the owner of the, the, the building might very easily go up to this Belvedere for a breath of fresh air as, as well as a great view of the community. Nearby on Church Street, another example of a post-World War II design that became very popular, the ranch house that comes to us actually from the American Southwest. Here is a ranch house that as we get into the later 20th century, what does this building tell us about American life? It tells us that we have a lot of affiliation with automobiles because no longer do we have a separate garage or a garage for just one automobile, but we have an attached garage for two automobiles. So this is starting, this tells us something about the change in culture going from the days of a separate carriage or barn for your horses to now a fully attached garage as part of your house. Three phases of construction are, are visible on this East Street building. We have an original Greek Revival house that was modernized with a lovely later 19th century window bay on the left. And then finally, a turn of the century arts and crafts style porch. All of these different additions are now part of the history of this house and make it all the more interesting for having changes of design over a long period of time. Likewise, here's another Greek revival house, this one on East Street, updated most likely in the 1890s with a very nice Greek Queen Anne style porch. And yet another example of a Greek revival style porch that when the, with the coming of the automobile, this owner decided it would be nice to have a coach porch or what we call a port cocher, that overhang that allows you to get in and out of your car without worrying about snow or rain or some of our other interesting. Now, cobblestone architecture. You have one cobblestone building, the village of Nunday. It is here on East Street. The style of this building is actually Greek Revival. You can see that by the eight over eight double hung sash, the wide white wood cornice under the roof line, as well as that highly distinctive front entrance that has a transom window over the front door and two side lights, all to let natural light into the center hall because when this was built in the 1840s, you would have had candle or oil powered lamps and that center hallway needed all of the natural light possible. Cobblestone architecture, and this is another view of that house, so you can see it was expanded over time. Certainly those dormers are part of the later expansion. Cobblestone architecture today is still part of a great mystery. We estimate that maybe a thousand cobblestone buildings were constructed in North America between the 1830s and 1860s. Most cobblestone buildings in North America are within a two hour drive of Rochester, New York. Here in Nunday, you are at the very edge of cobblestone country. Most cobblestone buildings are in the Lake Ontario shoreline if, if through Orleans, Monroe, and Wayne County. The farther south you get toward Pennsylvania, the fewer cobblestone buildings because again, this kind of cobblestone, these stones, which are a veneer, this is actually a field stone built house and those horizontal rows of cobbles are a decorative veneer, which creates what we call cobblestone. It was much more expensive to build a cobblestone house in Nunday, New York, or to the south of you, one of the largest cobblestone houses in North America, a spectacular Italianate mansion, third most cobblestone building in New York State. You are extremely fortunate to have this wonderful cobblestone building in Nunday, New York. It is one of your most important buildings. And if you'd like to know more about the fascinating world of cobblestone, 
architecture, you can go to the Cobblestone Museum website and a new database has been put together that features every cobblestone building in North America, both cobblestone buildings that are in existence as well as those that are demolished. A cooperative project of the Landmark Society and the Cobblestone Society. This database is to bring the knowledge of this remarkable masonry type to, to a much wider audience. So congratulations to the original owner who decided in Nunday which was not really near cobblestone country to have this building erected way back in the 19th century. Other 19th century buildings you'll see as you go through Nunday could be brick buildings. And often these early brick buildings are a signal that there was a brick manufacturing facility, not necessarily a factory, but oftentimes farmers who had clay deposits on their farms would have a kiln facility and there would be a kiln available in the town of Brighton up here in Monroe County. There were many farmers who had kilns. That's why we have so many farmhouses in Brighton, New York that are made in the 19th century were made of bricks. It wasn't that there was a large factory creating them, but often it was a local farmer who had a kiln and a clay deposit. So it would be very interesting to find out where the source of bricks were for Nunday day buildings in the 19th century, if it was on a kiln operation nearby, or if you might've had a small factory. Because here's another example of a later 19th century house and this house, and this is clearly a house from the 1890s that was built, manufactured. It's a much more harder surface. It is less porous and it is, certainly stands up better in our weather as one of your best surviving gambrel roof barns in the village. Queen Anne Showcase, South State Street. This was thrilling. Why? Because when you have buildings from the 1880s and 90s with all this decorative woodwork that was the trademark of the Queen Anne style, unfortunately, wood often rots, deteriorates, or is removed because of maintenance issues over the years. And this is remarkable to see all of the decorative woodwork, the spindle work up in the gables, the very elaborate turned posts, the bracketing that you see on the front porch. And much of this woodwork, even though you might have had a local lumber yard, with the coming of the railroad in the 19th century, many buildings that were constructed in the later 19th and early 20th century you could order decorative woodwork, stained glass windows, and other architectural features from catalogs, and they could be delivered to your local neighborhood, or in this case, the village of Nunday, fully produced because it could have very, very possibly been also ordered through catalog and shipped to Nunday for the, the developers who were building these Queen Anne style houses. South State Street also has a number of Italianate houses of various shapes and sizes, but I wanna emphasize again, you have more Italianate style houses than any other style period. No two of them are alike. This is another one that has a Belvedere on the hip roof. It has brackets under the main roof line. and It is a very handsome front porch, but it does not look again like any of the other Italianates. Each one has its own individual character. As we go down South State Street, we also see that additions and porches and later phases of architecture. In this case, somebody who was a designer that had a little bit of a challenge with the proportion selected for when this building was expanded. But it is a Greek revival building, probably from the 1840s or 50s. And then in the, the last decade of the 19th century, the ever popular porch which everyone wanted to have, was a major feature that was added to many of these pre-Civil War houses. Welcome to modern times, American Foursquare style architecture. This is a word that just came, and American Foursquare means that this style of house that you see, which was produced by tens of thousands of examples all over the country from the eight, late 1890s to about 1930, it is a square-shaped residence with a hipped roof, often with one, two, three, or four dormers, or in this case, just a single dormer on the side. It has a porch 
built of brick and a very modernistic style. We don't have any turned posts or elaborate Queen Anne woodwork because we are getting away from that highly fanciful design of the Victorian era and we are moving into the modern 20th century. American four square houses are often described as the most amount of house built for the least amount of money. It is one of the most practical floor plans you will ever find in American residential. Usually on the first floor, you have a living room, dining room, a bathroom, and four bedrooms. And when I say a bathroom, we don't take bathrooms for granted because for most of the 19th century, bathrooms were not a room in your house. You did not have a separate room. So this is one of the first styles of residential architecture where the bathroom is now an intrinsic component of the design. Also on South State Street in this early 1920s era, while we're looking to the modern American Foursquare, Americans still like to look back to colonial and classical design. And here is a very distinctive colonial revival style house, possibly architect designed, but I was really excited to see this for a number of reasons. It's in beautiful original condition. All of the original materials and windows are intact, but it also has something that became very popular as a fad and then died out. And that is a sleeping porch, which is that enclosed, that enclosed upper porch to the left. Sleeping porches were a mystery to me when I visited my best friend as in elementary school. We just knew it was this nifty porch off of the master bedroom, but we really didn't know why it was there because it seemed rather odd. It actually has a, a relationship to American medicine when medicine wasn't quite as successful or had the medicines that we have today. And that is the era of tuberculosis. We forget about tuberculosis being a scourge for centuries. There were no medicines to treat it until the 20th century, leaping out of doors year round. There were all sorts of approaches. Even in the 1930s, the state of New York built a tuberculosis sanatorium in Mount Morris, New York, one of the last sanatoriums to be built for TB because in the 1940s, there would be medicine that would then be available to treat tuberculosis patients. So the sleeping porch you see here on the second floor to the left, this became a fad, not only for new houses, but many older houses would have a sleeping porch added to them because they would often follow modern trends to sleep out of doors in fresh air year round in hopes of avoiding the Great White Plague, which was the other way, the other name by which tuberculosis was called. So sleeping porches today are decorative, they're wonderful, they have ventilation, but they had a very serious nature when they were originally popular. And yet again on South State Street here is yet another colonial revival house that has a sunroom below on the right, but a sleep, an enclosed sleeping porch on the second floor off of most likely the master bedroom. Expanded Greek revivals are not terribly common. And this is one of your most unusual examples of Greek revival design because while it has a porch, the porch is receding into the house or as they call it in the architecture dictionaries, this is an, what we call an in antis or recessed porch. Very unusual and something you might not have noticed for all the times you've driven down State Street this is a very specific and interesting example of that Greek revival design. On West Avenue, we have another example of Italianate style with that hipped roof. And again, a very large robust porch, but nine over nine double hung windows, which have remained intact. Now I am, I am looking at the time because we could spend several evenings looking at architecture that is traditional and very interesting in none day. But this is a talk that as we say in show business, we want to leave you wanting more, particularly wanting to get out and walk and discover these buildings on your own now that we're past probably winter weather. So when you're out looking around none day and you walk around, get out of your car, it's great exercise. Or even if you're at the flashing red light, at the four corners, start looking around at the architecture. Here we have an architecture, a Greek revival example, but there's a 1880s porch that's been added 
two eras of design, both now of equal historic significance. One of your most spectacular Italianates on West Street is this house. And my understanding is the reason for these larger houses on West Street is a reason that's very much under the radar screen today. When we look at the development of a community, we have to look at things that are often missing that have, were original factors in creating the success of a community. And over on West Street, you were not very far from the Genesee Valley Canal. And so that is one of the reasons, the proximity of the canal, it's bustling business for a number of years. That was part of, those, that was part of the impetus for building these grand houses on West Street. And this is certainly one of the most impressive and impressively intact of your Italian houses in the community. Likewise, another example and another cupola. I want to br briefly mention about cupolas because they have some st strange notions that go out in the community. A cupola is that little box at the top of the house. It is function is principally decorative, but it's also for ventilation. Notice all those windows. All those windows could be opened, and that helps when you, before the age of air conditioning and electric fans. That helps draw the heat from the house through those windows. We still have a house in Rochester today that was a public building for some years, and they still open the windows in a cupola because it is the best natural ventilation system for hot weather. So that is the other purpose for the cupola, not only decorative, but it was a vent for ventilation purposes. I was thrilled beyond measure to discover you have a surviving Gothic revival house in the village of Monday. The romantic styles from the 1840s to the 1880s took in architectural designs from many different countries. And how did we get those architectural designs out to the public? Well, there were books published in New York and Philadelphia and Boston. They were called pattern books. You in Monday, New York could buy a pattern book take it to a local carpenter and point to page 17 and say, see that drawing on page 17 with those floor plans? I want a Gothic revival house that looks to be able to buy. You would have a local, pardon the, pardon, I have to go off, I have to answer a phone, just a second. Okay, while well, Cynthia's gone, um, I just want to make a note that uh, I forgot to mention earlier that if you have questions, we will take questions at the end. And uh, when it comes to that, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. And now she's back. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I had planned for all contingencies. That was not one of them. Anyways, the Gothic Revival style, what is it? It is a romantic style. It is not in the classic style. And it has these magnificent carved barge boards along the end of the gable roof with a finial that sticks up and a pendant that projects down. If you look at the windows, they have shouldered moldings. And with this kind of architecture, those Beautiful decorative barge boards were made possible by the invention of the scroll saw. So craftsmen had a new tool and they could carve these curved, very elaborate barge boards for Gothic Revival houses. The problem is there are so many of the Gothic Revival houses that actually have been stripped of this kind of original detail. So that by the 21st century, it is an incredible rarity to find Gothic Revival houses with their decorative barge boards and other trim intact. So this, when I came down this street and saw this house, I was thrilled because I didn't know if I would find an example. So this is a very important building because it is your only surviving Gothic revival style house. But you have more Italianates with flare, this happens to have a hipped roof that has those flared 
gable peaks on its style. A house expanded over time as you walk down Oz. How do you pronounce the name of this street? Osgaby. Yes. Osgaby. Is, is that a person's name? Yes. yes. Okay. Who built the Gothic revival? Oh, so that's the Osgaby house. Well, his neighbor built a more expanded house, and again, with a, with at least three different phases of construction that you're looking at here. Though those six over six double hung windows have survived. Arts and crafts bungalows. As I mentioned, the heyday of business success in Nunday, New York, made it into the 20th century. And enough that you had local residents who were crafting the latest style of house design that did not come from Europe. The bungalow actually originated in Northern India where it was referred to as a bungalow and became most popular initially on, in California on the West Coast and then popular magazines and craftsmen like Mr. Stickley out of Syracuse promoted this style through magazines. This is an exceptional example of a bungalow style house from the 1910s or 20s. That swooping roof, the porch is always tucked under the roof, just like the designs of this type of building in Northern India. And they have those, what we call battered or angled porch posts that you see in single and pairs, which support the roof. This is a really exceptional building. And this is the kind of house you expect when you step inside, there will be acres of varnished gumwood trim and hardwood floors. Porches, we have just been discussing as an important component. But not all porches come as a wraparound. On Mill Street, we have this exceptional, one of a kind, frankly, Italian eight house with a very handsome decorative hood that's bracket supported roof that you see over the front entrance and beautiful matching brackets that have survived. In this case, this house is further enhanced by beautiful arched, what look like carved limestone lintels over the windows, which we have not seen on many houses previously. More Queen Anne design on Mill Street with all of the original details intact. And in this case, house painted several colors so you can appreciate the different designs because these Queen Anne style houses were really meant to have a main color, a trim color, and an accent color so you could enjoy all of the decorative details. That doesn't happen with many other houses. This one has a decorative barge board, which was a little unusual for this style house. But here's an example of what I wanted to bring out with the Queen Anne design. This is a very beautiful house. It has all of its Queen Anne design, but wouldn't it be fun to take three colors and paint the main body of the house, a main color, a principal color, the trim around the windows and then an accent color. And then you would see like the house we saw just two slides ago, the real design of that, because that's what this house was meant to have at least three different colors to bring out all that beautiful woodwork. On Mill Street, you have several remarkable Greek revival houses. One that was photographed for a national project and I don't have a, a slide of it there, but here we have the most iconic version of Greek revival design it looks like a temple, though it's a residence. It could just as easily be a bank, but this temple form with that triangular shaped pediment set over four robust Doric columns. The Doric column is just plain at the top. And those ridges that you see in the column, those are called flutes, F-L-U-T-E, just like the instrument. These are fluted Doric columns in a very important example of temple form Greek revival design in the village. Likewise, there are two other Greek revival houses on Mill Street. One is a little bit outside the community. It's on the north side of the road, and it is a very important example of Greek revival style, as is this house at 3454 Mill Road, more Greek revival robust design. When we get to Gibbs Street, we have some 20th century architecture that takes some of its design work from 
classical revival, but it also a little bit of the arts and crafts is sneaking into this house, most likely built in the 1920s. Another example of American Foursquare is seen here on Gibbs Street. And again, those very solid, robust looking battered columns that you see on the front porch. Italianate with brackets and more. If you walk down Fair Street and take a look at the side const, uh, hood to the right, that beautiful, those beautiful carved brackets that are holding up that type of that roof, that is the kind of detail that should have vanished 50 or more years ago so that it has survived into the 21st century is quite remarkable. Another American four square house, which also has some details from the colonial. You never know what the original designer or the client is going to want for the design. So that's why we get such variety among these single categories of American four square Queen Anne and Greek revival. Out on Payne Road, a very, ex a very interesting example of Greek revival. It almost looks a little top heavy with that very pronounced sturdy yet elegant triangular shaped pediment. And a detail we haven't had seen before, if you see those little rectangles, those are called freeze, F-R-I-E-Z-E, -E, freeze windows. Those are actually windows that probably have, they have decorative, in this case, it could be their wood or cast iron metal grates over them. And the window actually is a sliding panel that slides into the wall. So while this is a part of the decoration, these are very much functional windows. Once you get inside the building, you can see that. But from the outside, they look strictly like decorative openings. As you walk around, I mentioned that remodeling and updating is not something we invented with Home Depot. And this is one of the two examples we saw one earlier of that stucco campaign of the 1920s that invited owners to create a maintenance-free house if you put stucco over the clapboard on your wood frame building. Down in the town of Gorham, New York, on the east side of Canandaigua Lake, we did a study and the stucco craftsmen very nicely, when they did these stuccoing over projects, they put the date in the front gable of every house that they stuccoed. So when you drive through Gorham, you'll look at a Greek revival house from 1850, but the stucco craftsmen would put the date of 1920 up in the front gable so we know exactly when the stucco was applied. We didn't have quite that benefit here in Nunday, but it's quite clear that this is one of those buildings that was a part of, like we put vinyl siding on buildings, many buildings today. This was an application that was popular in the 1920s. So as you drive around Nunday, or I hope you get out and walk around Nunday right now because spring is a great time to get out and discover your community. You're going to see 19th century construction. You're going to see mid-century modern construction. Mid-century modern is a fairly new term in architecture it means buildings constructed between the 1930s and the 1970s. So you have some dramatic examples of mid-century modern residential design in your community, most of which are at the edge of the village where there, was, there were lots available for new construction. The most important thing to take away from a presentation like this is possibly today, You've seen buildings you've never seen before because most of us drive the same roads day in and day out. We, if we're going from the house to school, the house to work, the house to run an errand, we take the same street. And there I'm guessing there may be streets in Nunday, New York, the village, and particularly Nunday, the town you have never visited. So what better way to spend the beautiful spring weather that we are getting right now. The leaves are coming out right now. The redbud trees, the flowering crab, and of course the lilacs are bursting into bloom. Now you're at a little higher elevation, so you're not, you might be a little bit behind in terms of your bloom sequence, but there couldn't be a better time at this, 
in May or June, but National Preservation Month, to get out, walk around Nun Day, drive around Nun Day, go explore Nun Day, whether it's a beautiful 19th century complex of buildings like this Italianate house and its outbuildings, or one of my favorite outdoor resources, the local cemetery. The cemetery for many decades in most community was doubled as a park. It was not considered irre irreligious to take a picnic lunch, go visit your family plot, do some pruning, plant some flowers, and enjoy the open space, the beautiful mature trees, and the case of Oakwood Cemetery, the Victorian garden style design with those terraced hills. Those hills were not created by the last glacier, those were all part of an intended design. Those terraces were actually cut and placed onto the hillside. So if you have not visited Oakwood Cemetery, be sure that is part of your walk as you go around and explore beautiful Nun Day to get to see your very important example in the region of a Victorian garden style oasis. So I hope this presentation has given you some food for thought, has showed you some buildings you maybe didn't know about, or talked about buildings you've seen for years, but really never knew their origins. Because the most important thing is that all of this, the buildings, structures, and sites in Nande tell your history, give Nande its clearly unique design character, and are worth preserving and as you've demonstrated, have already created some really cutting edge preservation projects with the renovation of your municipal center and the renovation of the union block. So thank you for inviting me. I've been looking forward to this delayed prop. This does anyone has any questions or comments, we can open the floor. Okay, everyone. Um... You can, if you have questions, please unmute yourselves. And we, I, I will admit that we have some of the streets that are, uh, the locations are a little bit off, but. Uh, <laughs> I open. apologize for that. <laughs> and um, so uh, we have a few, few questions. Oscoby Street is really Seward Street, right? Yeah. And. Um, oh. Um, was it called Oh, that's why I forgot to mention about those painted, the, yes, there's that white Italianate house that backs up to the cemetery. Is that Seward Street? Yes. yes. The one that has the painted decorative glass. Yes. Okay, I, I, that's why I kept waiting for a slide that said Seward Street. Yes, any of you that go out walking on Seward Street, there is a magnificent Italianate style house. It's a big white house on the north side of Seward. It's now apartments. Look at the front doors because they have their original decorative glass. It's called reverse painted glass. The design of the glass is actually painted and fired on the glass panels. That is incredibly rare that those have survived 140 years in that house. I was just thrilled to see that. Now it's a small detail, but as you can see, preservationists get excited by small details. Okay, uh, anyone here have a question in this room? You mentioned the Chicago window. That's a big center window and then on each side is a smaller Window. Yes, in fact, it, it yes, that is actually that is in exactly what a Chicago large center window, which is usually not a window that on either side when Chicago was exploding with new architecture, particularly department stores and larger public buildings. That Chicago style window became incredibly popular. If any of you have been in downtown Rochester, New York, and looked at the former Sibley department store building on Main Street, the entire exterior is 
Chicago style windows. So yes, that is, it came from Chicago, which had a real robust, um, there was an architecture firm known as Burnham and Root, of course, Frank Lloyd Wright, Louis Sullivan. This was a huge architecture um, community of in innovation in Chicago. And that Chicago style window came out of that design period. Okay, any other questions from here? All right, any other questions from our people that are out there um, listening? Unmute yourselves if you'd like. Okay. Well, if there are no other questions, we thank uh, Cynthia very much for her very interesting talk. And um, hopefully everybody enjoyed that and uh, will indeed discover things that they have not observed before and start looking for the various interesting things that Cynthia has brought up tonight. So, uh, and I'd like to thank the Historical Society and Joan and her team for um, this invitation and put in a plug. This, the historical, go to the website of the Monday Historical Society. It is an outstanding resource of information, both written and um, picture images of the community. You're very lucky to have not only the website, but your fabulous Historical Society headquarters where many of you are seated. Yes, we invite everyone to stop in and see us. Unfortunately, there are uh, people who live far enough away so they don't get here very often, but we certainly want the people who are nearby to know we're here and to visit. And uh, so we invite everybody to stop by and uh, make an appointment if you if we're not open when you're going to be here. And uh, and Cynthia, um, thank you again, and we will be in touch. Thank you very much. Thank you.